And the sheriff is telling me he was leaning over and said, my God, there's not even any blood. And the vet said, that's right. I can't find even moisture. He said, I went up to the jugular vein. It's cut. It should be swamped with blood. There's nothing, Sheriff. There's nothing. It is such a pleasure to meet you. I can't even, I'm, I'm going to try really hard to be professional <laughs> rather than fangirling. But, you know, it seems kind of strange to start with this. But one of the things I've noticed in all the years I've listened to you, and I'm sure there's plenty of interviews I haven't heard, but there has, you know, there hasn't been a month that I haven't heard a Linda Moulton Howe report of some sort since I was eight years old. So I haven't heard you discuss a lot about your younger years, like pre-college. And I, from what I gathered, unless my info is wrong, I believe you grew up in Boise and had a father who was heavily involved in aeronautics. He was director of aeronautics for the state of Idaho from the time I was a, f- a four-year-old. Oh, my gosh. And we flew everywhere. We didn't go in cars. And that was wow. one of the things that my brother and I realized looking back. We just expected that we would be in the air anywhere we went. And it may or may not have had an impact on both of us as being, we've always been explorers. And my brother went off to be a pilot and was in the Vietnam War. He had the fastest save in the Vietnam War. It's written up in a book uh, how he saved some people when there were Kong coming and the helicopter had to make a decision, my brother being the decider, of dropping the helicopter down into where Kong were shooting to try to see. And his, it was a gamble was the voice on the other end of the rope, an actual American or a Kong that had been learning how to sound like American. This really went on in the war. And my brother has this incredible story that was written up in a book of having to make a decision going down with other men in the helicopter that he's in and being prepared for whatever is going to happen. And it is called the fastest save in the Vietnam War. And that's Jim Moulton, my brother. Oh, my goodness. So right from the very beginning, you would say that we grew up in uh, an unusual household where our father, head of aeronautics, was going out saving people gathering people at crashes and kenneth arnold the kenneth arnold (sighs) of the 1947 june uh the report of the nine going uh uh, next to mount flying saucer what started it all (laughs) was a great friend of my father's because he did search and rescue for chet moulton and i still can remember as if it were yesterday this part why i have no idea Here's my dad is sitting in a chair here. Kenneth Arnold is here. I think I was five or six years old. I'm on the floor. Uh, Their daughter, sort of my age, is here. And we had been playing jacks. But I am now listening because my father begins arguing with Kenneth Arnold. And when my father argued with anybody about anything, we listened. And it had to do with the first of many, many discussions over the last 80 or 75 years, wherever you want to start counting, um, that my father was arguing that there were no ETs, Mm -hmm. that it was something else. And for some reason, that, that discussion in Kenneth Arnold's house, I remember that much vividly and then jumped to 1979 and I'm director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver. And a lot of people don't realize that I did my undergraduate work at the University of Colorado 
And I was there uh, from 60 to 65 because the way I got through school was entering the Miss Boise, Miss Idaho, and Miss America pageants at my father's urging for scholarship money. Yep. So In fact, I was going to point that out because I think so many people from my generation dismiss that as like, oh my gosh, so superficial. No, this was the way no. that ambitious women were able to open doors back then because there weren't the as only, many avenues. It was the only way to get substantial scholarship money. And I uh, took a year out at the request of the governor of the state of Idaho uh, that Miss Idaho, 1963, Linda Moulton, would travel the state meeting people, meeting various mayors, going to various Lions Club, being able to talk with young people. I did that for a year. Mm -hmm. And that's why I didn't uh, graduate from the University of uh, Colorado until 65. And then I went back to Washington, D.C. for a year to work for Senator Len B. Jordan, uh, the senator from Idaho, and I was his education assistant I have never and, heard that before. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It, I loved working in Washington. I, it was the most exciting place to be, except this was the crunch year of the beginning of the horror of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And I and so many others my age were against the war. And I remember that the senator's office where I worked was about 100 feet down from the Senate Foreign Relations where the committee had their meetings. And I could leave my desk and walk in and listen when they allowed. And it was all of the vigorous arguments about what the United States should do in oh Vietnam. And I still can remember that a day there with cameras going, something had happened. And I'm there uh, listening. And I was looking around the room, and for some reason, I'm asking myself, the heroes in this room are the reporters. And I had never seen life at that mo until that moment like that, the, that the reporters, the men and the women who on a daily cycle are trying to get facts, trying to report in difficult, politically manipulated subjects, and it, that was the moment in watching the Vietnam uh, War argument in Washington, D.C., that I said, wow. I want, this is what I want to do. I want to do documentary films. And I applied to half a dozen universities that I really hoped I could get into because I had a pretty good uh, record. And Stanford University was one on that list, and they gave me the Stanley Bobert Scholarship for 1960 uh, entry in the, uh, I think it was the fall of 66 to 68. It was a two-year master's, master's degree yeah. program. Wow. And because they gave me the Stanley Bobert Scholarship, it paid for everything for two years. Oh I goodness. go from Washington to California with the idea that I am going to join the ranks of people who investigate and report. And um, when you realize that at that time, 66, 67, 68, the Stanford Linear Accelerator was just started for the very first time on Earth was trying to get computers to analyze the particle bombardment in the Stanford Linear Accelerator known as SLAC. And I took on that project for my master's thesis. And I was working with physicists who were just so delighted that there was this student, especially a female. I was the only female in my class in 66 to 68, there were wow. journalism, there were other things besides documentary where there were women, but in documentary, I was the only female. And the physicists were encouraging and helped me do my master's film on this very first application of AI to something tedious. Wow. And then I was hired right out of school 
to KNBC in Los Angeles. And when I think back that I went from Idaho and flying in a plane with dad and mom and my brother all the time to Washington, D.C., the center of huge power, seeing that reporting is what I wanted to do, and I would end up now going back across the country to California, and that when I was hired by KNBC in Los Angeles, one of the most massive cities in the world, I would get in a car and travel every day. Any all any reporter was just traveling immense. Yeah. I covered my first murder. Oh. I had to face the earthquake. Oh. In the, that that big earthquake yeah. that happened in the 66 to 68 time period. So uh, the idea of covering wars and covering politics was added to by this massive city and that there was something in taking on just the sheer geography that by the time, and I, and I was married uh, by then, a classmate, and uh, he wanted to go back to Harvard to get another degree and this is quaint almost, <laughs> uh, an MBA because of the brand new corporate world that was opening up in Time Inc. Cable. <laughs> so he wow. gets he gets to, he'd been in Yale, Stanford, and now he goes to Harvard for another degree to join up in the cable. And I'm hired out of KNBC at WCBB, the ABC network, to do all the production on their medical program called House Call. And that's where I got a Peabody for the work that I was doing in medicine. So all of these facets were all came together in between 65 leaving uh, undergraduate. And by the time that we were in Boston and my uh, then husband was going into cable, and he got hired by the CBS station in Denver, or it, it, not me, he didn't, I was, you did. but he yeah. was assigned by Time Inc. to go to Denver because that's where they wanted to uh, have the base for their new uh, uh, video division. And it was to save money that they would have airline tickets going New York, Denver, Denver, LA, not New York, LA, the the things that get you to wherever you are go. So wow. But what is also interesting is uh, my work in medical, the medical programming by then was well known. And the general manager of the CBS station in Denver called me in Boston and said, we understand that you are moving to Denver. So I was going to negotiate with WCVB to purchase your uh, house call series. But why should I do that when I can hire the producer? And that's how you... That was the pivotal moment of all of this, wow. that I am hired before we move to work in the CBS station, working on medicine, science, and the environment. And were, did you and feel did. like you actually had the reins to do what you wanted to do there? Like, were you, did, what was that like? I mean, back then, I can't imagine. When I think back at one of the first things, one of the challenges that the general manager said, I want you to do a program with Governor Richard Lamb, mm -hmm. and I want it to be about X. So right from the start, that's why I was telling all of you this in detail. I just kept going from one big institutional place to another, not because I was demanding. It just seemed like the universe was just taking me like this. And that I end up doing live studio shows with the governor of Colorado, bringing in people who had worked for the CIA on issues affecting Colorado. Uh, and then... It was in August, and it was 1979. 
And the crew and I had come off of a shoot on a documentary. And we were at the end of a day. And Marco Kane, audio, uh, Richard Lerner, camera, and me were sitting at a table. We're discussing a documentary that we've been working on. And Mark had come in. He would come in and out of productions that I was doing because he was a great steady cam operator. And he had joined us on this shoot, but he had just come off of working on 2020 in New York. And so we're sitting at lunch talking about this other totally not related to anything of having to do with UFOs or animal mutilations or anything. And Mark says, you know what a stickler you are about me keeping my battery belts charged. Another anachronism. When I came out of Stanford, you were umbilical corded in battery belts between Nagras and cameras. And so you had to work like a ballet team. And it was <laughs> completely different than later on when we got into uh, like cell phones, uh, recording right. material. And Marco Kane was a master of being able to ha be ge all geared but be able to move the camera with a steady cam that gave you the ability to float. When you float through a scene, we were floating uh, out in a variety of things. And he says, you know what a stickler you are about me keeping my battery belts charged. And he said, I just came off of the weirdest shoot of my life. That's exactly what he said to me. What are you talking about? He said, it's this new show out in New York, 2020. And he said, we were in Oklahoma and Kansas and Nebraska. And he said, I made sure our battery belts were charged. And Linda, we would show up. It would be a dead animal, weird. I remember him saying, no blood, no tracks around the body of the animal. And Linda, every single time we walked toward one of those mutilated animals, the batteries would fail. Wow. What? I'm, I'm, what? Now he's really got my attention. And I said, well, what could possibly do that? He said, we don't know. They brought it, uh, in somebody to try to see if we had some, some terrible thing was happening to our equipment. They couldn't find anything. So I got phone numbers, people to call, and Linda begins what is the going to be the rest of her life and doesn't know it. <laughs> Well, because it was a I mystery. Call up, you had I to call know. Up the ABC network in New York. I asked to talk with the head of the the operation. I'm director of special projects at the CBS station. I repeat, I have an audio man who's been working with you with Steadicam, and he said you were working on this uh, strange animal mutilations, and that you couldn't keep the batteries running. That's right. I said, well, when are you going to air the this broadcast? We're not. I'll never forget that. I said, what do you mean you're not? He said, we're in the business of news, and we could never get an answer to what was happening to the batteries or what was happening to these cattle. So we scrubbed it. I said, well, how much did you shoot? 130,000 feet. This is double system back in 1970. Nine. Wow. And when he said that, Mark not being able to keep batteries running and that ABC had shot over 100,000 feet, a double system, and they've scrubbed it because they couldn't get answers. Next. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that is exactly what pulled me into this. And <clears throat> this is funny now in retrospect. It's when we thought that the government of the United States was a government of, by, and for the people. Yeah. Well, I and mean, I called, you I questioned that yourself, though. I mean, you had said you were starting the, to. I called the Central Intelligence Agency in Washington. I introduced myself. I said, I'm now investigating something that we've run into here in Colorado and surrounding states. I would like to put in a request, and I'm thinking I have every right in the world to do this. 
a, a request to interview one of your field agents that you might be investigating these strange animal mutilations. And a man, I believe, had answered the phone and he said, just a moment. And a female voice came on, ice sickles dripping in the sound of her voice. We do not make any field agents available to the media for interviews. And that was the beginning of another lesson mm -hmm. about the completely different atmosphere of having grown up the way I had grown up with respect. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You go to a policeman if you're in trouble. The government of the United States is the best government there, there could ever be. Mm -hmm. And I start in innocence. I just want to know why the batteries failed. And I want to know why there would be all these excisions on these bodies. Remember, I did all of that medical yeah. work in Boston that I was a part of a Peabody. I want to know how can these be bloodless? That's where it starts. And two weeks after that, phone call to the CIA. I had It had been recommended to me uh, by some people that I knew in uh, the, we'll call it environmental media. And they said, you need to talk with Sheriff Tex Graves up in uh, Sterling, Colorado. And I called. Everybody knew me because I was always being written about on the media page. And so the sheriff says, yeah, and I drove up, took a couple of hours. He told me to meet him in a vacuum cleaner shop because he was retiring after 30 some years of being a sheriff. He was retiring and he was going to run this little vacuum cleaner shop. And that's where we met. And he had a box. It was about this long, about like this. And that was where he started with me. He said, I got a table. He said, I took these photos, Linda. These are my Polaroid photos, a sheriff of this, on, on this whole investigation of animal mutilations. And we started laying them out and there were too many for the table. I asked him if I could put them, some of them on the floor. So now we have a table and the floor and it's his life, his sh sh uh, Polaroids as sheriff. And we are going story by story, almost like I was in a helicopter over. And it was the best way to be introduced that I could ever have imagined because in those 166 color Polaroids, you can't manufacture, you oh. cannot manipulate a Polaroid. And this is the sheriff who took all of the Polaroids, who is taking me through every single one of these cases and had stacks of the offense report cases that went with the Polaroids. It was like I was given in one afternoon the fastest wow. crank up through the, a man that everybody respected. And then it got to, what have you seen with veterinarians? Have you taken veterinarians? And he tells me, this is perhaps one of the single most incredible of all that I have heard in 44 years, what I'm going to share with you now. He said, the first call I got, I'd already known that other sheriffs were running into this trackless, bloodless. And I called up the vet and I said, I don't want to waste time. I don't want you to be waiting. I want you to come with me. I want you to do the necropsy right there in front of me and we can talk about it and the vet said ear eye tongue removed deep in the throat jaw flesh removed no blood genitals rectum cord out classic all of the excisions are on the surface of the body all of them and the vet said, Sheriff, I, I want to see. I want to see what's inside of this animal. Mm -hmm. And Sheriff Tex Graves, Logan County, 
watches the veterinarian with his scalpel start opening up the chest. There's been, there's nothing there. It's the vet who is opening up the chest, goes in and in a few minutes, and he's put got his white gloves and everything. The sheriff says, the vet went like this, brought his index finger up, the white glove, and he said, look at this. And the sheriff said, I don't know what the hell I'm looking at. <laughs> it's glistening. And it's afternoon light. It's not dark. It's afternoon light. And the sheriff said, what are you showing me? He said, this is pericardium over my index finger. This is pericardium. But sheriff, pericardium, you have one around your heart. Cattle have them around their hearts. I've just gone in. You watched me come into the chest of this animal. Sheriff, and then he pulled back like this. Look and had a flashlight. There's no heart. There should be a nine by 11 by 13 inch large heart. There's no heart. And I am showing you that on my finger is the pericardium that wrapped some kind of heart that is not here. And the sheriff is telling me he was leaning over and said, my God, there's not even any blood. And the vet said, that's right. I can't find even moisture. He said, I went up to the jugular vein. It's cut. It should be swamped with blood. There's nothing, Sheriff. There's nothing. I have no explanation for how anything like this has happened inside of this animal that is also mutilated on the outside. And then Sheriff Tex Graves, who was a great mimic of uh, conversations, he said the vet's turned to him and said, don't you ever call me out on another one of these because I am not going to stand in front of reporters and tell them that what has happened to this mutilated animal is impossible. Wow. And there is where Linda Moulton Howe, it was almost like a convergence of timelines. As the sheriff was telling me that story, I just felt like I was hit with electricity, not knowing that the whole rest of my life would be dominated one way or another. And it was like the beginning of all of the high strangeness that for the next years I would experience myself. And that when, because that was 1979, September, I started immediately working on what became A Strange Harvest, my documentary that got an Emmy. And it was the first and only a 90-minute special that was done on animal mutilations. And in the process of doing that was the famous Judy Doherty case that was at the end. She was a wonderful person. And uh, what she experienced with her daughter and uh, her husband coming home from a bingo game outside of Houston and seeing a light and seeing a beam and seeing something coming up in the beam. And then she, her daughter, end up apparently inside of this craft. And it is one of the most detailed, one of the most important firsthand experiences that would be, would ever be told by two humans who were there together. And I jumped there because when the film, which has extraordinary information from law enforcement and humans and and all over. And it's still pretty easy to find too, just so everybody knows, you can get it on Amazon Prime, you can get the sequel on Amazon Prime, they're pretty easy to find. Um, Yes, and go to earthfiles.com, my website that I've had since 1991, and uh, all my books and all of my documentaries are at earthfiles.com too. But after that, uh, the the broadcast date i still can remember may 25th 1980 is when at with a lot of promotion in uh, the tv guide and all of that it's the largest audience for a cbs station kmgh tv produced a program in the history of the station 
and I, I say this to underscore something. This was the first program that was done with hundreds and hundreds of scenes in a world in which animal mutilations by UFOs and ETs didn't exist except for law enforcement, which is the the other part that as I get am getting ready to pack up and leave Sheriff Tax Graves that day in 1979, September. He looked at me. It's like we had gone through a little war together, <laughs> watching and looking and talking. And, and then he looked at me and he said, Linda, I'll save you some time. The perpetrators of these bloodless, trackless animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. Wow. It, it, it was like, that was it. That was the moment. And then my life is glued. And when my film then is broadcast May 25th, 1980, it was like an explosion. The station had never experienced anything like this. The mail room was getting mail coming in from all over, and there's no computers. This had to be handwritten, yeah. typed. We didn't have computers then. And they were dragging these huge canvas bags of mail up to my office. The switchboard kept saying, Linda, we are so sorry. We cannot keep up with all of the phone calls and messages for you. And it was like the curtain, is, this is happening on the rest of my life. And I'm assuming that I'm going to be doing this again and again until there is proof of ETs. And that very first week with all this commotion and the the uh, uh, the newspapers are talking about how this is the largest audience ever in a uh, any produced uh, local television. And I get a phone call from the general manager. And I considered him a friend uh, in 1978 or nine. I think it was 1978. I was nominated for a national Emmy for a series of documentaries I had done before all this. And he and his wife, flew with me back to New York City. We were at the big national Emmy, everything. I was a finalist. I was wonderful. And I considered him a friend. So the phone call that comes from his office in the days following the first broadcast, uh, Linda, I want you to come up. And... I knocked on his door up on the fifth floor and he opened it and I knew immediately something was wrong just by the energy and the way he was looking at me. And he ushered me in and everything now is very uncomfortable. And he's, he turned to me, he said, sit down. I know that you want to continue investigating these animal mutilations, but I'm here to tell you we're not going to do it because I'm not going to lose commercial sponsors who have already started canceling because we did this broadcast talking about extraterrestrials mutilating animals. And that was the beginning of the first crack across my windshield that even if you are reporting truth even if you are breaking news about extraterrestrial interactions with your own planet and humanity and animals, that there was a huge controlling factor that I would meet and be blocked by over and over and over and over. And that was the first. And so just to be clear, do you think that was truly coming from sponsors or was that the story that was given because there there was a different pressure being exerted? It could be either or both at the same time. He never ever was my friend again. 
Wow. I stayed at the station. I did the next show. I think that I did the documentary was astronaut training at Martin Marietta. I stayed in the space category. Mm-hmm. and But privately, my life with a husband and a daughter, where I thought I had worked hard before, I now am doing double duty, like pulling the gear shift, and I'm working 18-hour days, sometimes only taking a nap. Because I'm now, I, I, I'm not allowed to continue publicly to do the follow-up. I'm, I'm having to do different subjects, which means I have to be the producer, writer, director, editor that I have always been. And I have to do it on new subject matter while I am not going to stop Oh, uh, dealing not. with the mail and the phone calls and my own follow-up to the most exciting question in my life. Yeah. If extraterrestrial yeah. biological entities are bloodlessly and tra- without tracks, mutilating animals all over this planet and way many more animals than cattle. It's reindeer. It's all over. What? Do the extraterrestrial biological entities want from all of this? And there was just no way that I was going to let go of that. So I began feeling like I was in two worlds simultaneously. And then came the problems with my phone, my going down. Everybody knew me, my going down to the phone company, finding that I have an official. They said it's an official tap on your home line and your office line. And Linda Moulton Howe is going through the baptism of a new kind of fire that I am now some kind of threat to my government. Okay, so I have a question because you had a daughter at the time. Was there ever a point where you felt like that was the reason you might stop, not because your boss didn't want the material covered at your job, but did that frighten you at any point? No, it is a good question. Um, I think more than anything that I was not personally, I was not feeling any fear of any kind at that juncture. My husband worked for Time Inc. It was a corporation. And he said, quite frankly, you can't talk about this at when we go to dinner and when we have these meetings. And my daughter uh, had always had, we had somebody who would be with my daughter when I was at work. So she had always grown up that way. And I was then in this new world where there's no question in my mind that extraterrestrial intelligences are known to the United States government. No question whatsoever. But that to bring up even that much Mm. in a corporate dinner or meeting would jeopardize my husband's work. Oh my gosh, that must have been hard. To answer your question, what started happening when I look back, I just started pulling out into a place where I was doing whatever I could do. But I had to also live this normal veneer. Wow. And eventually, I think that the the next most dramatic moment to share with you tonight and that brings it all for your audience into a focus that you all can then think about what I'm going to say now. If it were declared to you and to everyone in a huge worldwide satellite press conference, I'm going to say the words that I read in a document at Kirtland Air Force Base here in Albuquerque. While I was working on a contracted documentary for Home Box Office. Home Box Mm -hmm. Office are the ones who came to me at the CBS station and said, we want 
to contract you to do. Uh, it was an hour or 90 minute special for us. So I, that's why I left the station to work with HBO. I was thrilled thinking I would have more freedom. Mm. And a, an attorney named Peter Gersten, he had filed the first Freedom of Information Act request to intel, military, uh, a whole bunch of people at the end of, uh, was 79 to 80, somewhere in there, uh, after FOIA became law. As an attorney, he was hired by Citizens Against UFO Secrecy to bring this issue against all uh, sorts of uh, government institutions had ended up in the Supreme Court in January of 1980. Everything blacked out. And Peter Gersten was a person that I had talked to before I went to sign the contract for Home Box Office. And he and I and another man, Patrick Quage, we met uh, in the uh, Washington, D.C., and had dinner when after I had signed the home box office uh, contract. And Peter Gersten says, I want you to see some correspondence that I have from an AFOSI agent in Albuquerque at Kirtland Air Force Base that seems to know about animal mutilations, extraterrestrials. And he said, you, if you can get him to give you names and addresses and dates, you and I can work together. I will do the same thing with you that I did on FOIA. And we will get into what happened at Ellsworth Air Force Base with an alleged UFO that came down and a shoot. A gun is drawn and something with light melts a gun in a security guard, military security guard's hand. The laser. Yeah, the famous laser. And he said, and we'll, we can produce this. We can pro and I said, that's great. Jump. It's Peter Gerson sets up the meeting. Kirtland. This is where AFOSI Richard Doty is the one who is to show me these documents that Peter Gersten has correspondence about. And I think I'm going to be there for a short period of time to get the names, addresses, and phone numbers of the people in Ellsworth Air Force Base that had this encounter with some kind of craft and beings and the exchange of pulling a gun and laser. And instead, Mr. Doty pulls out of a drawer, I think it was a dozen pages, eight and a half by 11. It says, my superiors have asked me to show this to you and hands them. You can read it, but you cannot take notes because I had a notebook. Well, little he did said, he know that you have the best memory of anyone in the <laughs> world. So that was a terribly dangerous thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I, my whole life, I'm 81 now. I'll be 82 in January. The, the numbers um, just irritate me because I want to keep going on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and oh. But I always have this incredible ability to just hold documents up, questions. I, I, it was like I had a file drawer I could open up at any point. And now at 81 going on 82, I do it. I, I still have a, a keen memory, thank God. But there are things that like that that got me through so many of these difficult things that I went through yeah. for 40 some years because I could keep but anything I saw, I could keep. Okay, now, having said that, it's a perfect prelude because when he pulls out these pages, and he said, and I want you to move from the chair you're in to that one. Eventually, it w I would learn it was because it was where I was Camera. videotaping. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you and your audience right now, I am reading about old history that a lot of us know about sign and grudge 
nothing too interesting. And I turn a page and I'm reading and I was a fast reader and I get to, and I can still feel it. I can still see it. My eyes see the words, my mind stops and I start like a loop. I'm reading and I'm aware that my mind is going around and around and around on these words and here they are. These, quote, these extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create Homo sapien. That is one hell of a heavy duty sentence in the context of a repressed planet that has never been told the truth, but that is a sentence. Now I'm gonna jump to the end of the document, projects. Project Garnet, I said at the time, remember your birthday, Garnet. Garnet, stone, first stone. Project Garnet, and this said, quote, all questions and mysteries about the evolution of Homo sapien on this planet have been answered and this project is closed. And I must have read those words over and over and over. I think I went into a mild state of shock. Oh, I can imagine. And, I, and the reason I stress that tonight, if we don't go any further, those two sentences, from my point of view, as we speak on November 3rd, 2023, after 44 years of interacting with this content, those two sentences were profound truth. Then, in that office at Kirtland, they are profound truth today. And we are still living on a planet in which the profound implications of all of the whole huge grand landscape that Homo sapien is a genetically manipulated experiment by extraterrestrials, that is the truth. And that the governments of the world led in World War II by the Five Eyes, the United States, England, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. They were being exposed to some information related to UFOs and ETs, but that's where they slammed down MJ-12, they slammed down everything. No one was ever to know the truth, and I call it today. We are living in classified reality. This is classified hmm. reality. The truth the profound truth that our government knows and has known in terms of units that have been allowed this information includes other solar systems. When, when are hu humans going to finally be allowed to know the whole reality without classifications? The big argument is it will hurt religions, the stock market will fall. Does that mean right. that there are power brokers? Well, it reminds me a little bit of you. That they're never going to change, that they're never going to allow the world and humanity to ever know the truth. If that is what they think is workable, it's not. And that's why I feel that the most important thing of my life, if now is the time, if 2024 is going to be the year that they're finally going to open up the headline, that I have at least helped, I've at least contributed. I never wanted to give up on trying to get that huge headline that we all deserve. We're not alone in this big universe. Well, I mean, I don't think anybody could argue that the needle has been moved tremendously by you. And I, I, for one, even in the last five years, have seen so many places where there are these discussions about, you know, finally, there's less stigma. And I think back to the 80s, 
when the stigma was rampant and it didn't stop you. I feel like it stopped almost everyone. And there were so many times where, especially as a female, uh, covering things like this, you were standing on an island. And I think it's just incredible. I I hope it happens for myself, but I also hope it happens for you because you deserve to see it at this point. Um, Yes. And to underscore, I'm not anti-male, but they don't play. Oh, no. They don't play fair. Well, Um, and and being the only one. one, It's almost funny. And it was at a conference and I had been asked by a colleague to come to have lunch or whatever. And it was a table, all men. It was probably 10. And uh, there was no chair. I'd been invited, but there was no chair for me. Oh, my goodness. One of the men uh, turned around or they stood up and turned around. I think it was a table behind and people were leaving and they were grabbing a chair. And uh, and I'm noticing this. And one of the men who will remain unnamed forever said, well, we don't need your presence here anyway if you are going to be insisting that there are extraterrestrials mutilating animals on this planet, that is, and then spelled the B word. Uh, oh my god! I'll never forget that because I've been invited to come to the table to have a discussion and they didn't have a chair. And that when they are getting a chair comes this you know, terrible insult. But the thing about this, my whole life ended up being unexpected because of animal mutilations and ETs right at the beginning of my career. Right. I never gave up. And therefore, I never started screaming at people or it was, okay, then I know who you are. I'm right. going to continue to try to investigate as many facts, get as many eyewitnesses as I possibly can, and never give up. Well, that's my motto. That's, I mean, that's the thing that's really remarkable to me because I think about standing there in that circumstance. What was it from your background or your mother and what she instilled or your father and what he instilled that made you sit in that situation and not shy away at all? Say, okay. Well, I'm not going to go head to head with you because that's a waste of my energy, but I'm also not deterred in any way. Like what instilled that boldness? I think it's my father. He he was brilliant, my dad, uh, in so many ways. And he, he never, ever took on anything like what I'm describing as a subject. I think that he was a demonstration to my brother and me. My brother would never give up. And there was something about dad would always say, if you're going to do it, do it right and do it full. That's Mm -hmm. what he would say, do it right and do it full. And I think when you have parents that live their words, it does. It it sets up a resonance. And that dad, he was director of aeronautics. He was doing something that not a lot of people did, building uh, airports in a day at various places. Uh, he was uh, up for a nomination for a Jimmy Doolittle Award as the director of aeronautics, being creative and getting pilots and more airports in. And he ran into buzz saws. I remember. Mm. I can remember. But dad never gave up either. And mom, she was um, the, the gift that our mother gave us, I think. She could not tell a lie if, I don't know. Isn't that wonderful? Oh. She was the most honest. And when you have honesty and you have perseverance and you never give up, I think if everybody had those ingredients, it would be, thank gosh that I did. And I am, I am here in front of you tonight, um, more excited 
about the what we should begin to be learning beyond the wonderful web telescope images that we should be moving into now a whole new era where I hope our government and at least the five I governments from World War II who know the truth, that we're going to get the big crack in the, we'll call it the world skull. We're not alone in this universe. It would be in, crazy if we were. Oh, yeah. And and that that maybe there are friendlies, neutrals, and hostiles. Well, that's the way Earth is. We should be used to that. Yeah. So we need to be educated, not yeah. repressed, right. not told, no, 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 you don't need to know. Let's get the whole planet educated, and it might stop some human wars. That oh, would be incredibly that. wonderful if that would happen. So obviously what you saw that day had a, had a profound impact on you. Thank goodness for the photographic memory. Um, also knowing uh, with the years that have come since then of all the research you've done and the people you've spoken with and the things that you've seen and experienced, can you point to the strongest piece or pieces of evidence that you have encountered that have really substantiated that even more so in your mind? Because, you know, it sounds to me, given how unquestioning you are of that at this point, you have probably gotten a lot of evidence in support of that over the years. And I'm, you know, the cliff notes, what would be the biggest pieces that you would point to? I have had some very serious an important whistleblower information. Which I'm sure you have to be very cautious about what you say, yeah. But I'm going to answer in an unexpected way because I have never, that was a great question. And it, it only has, is occurring to me as you ask that, what is flooding me. To hear the full interview, 15 minutes more with Linda Moulton Howe, Join the Fright Day Society at thefrightdaysociety.org. As a member, you'll have access to over 100 hours of additional content, including more interviews like this, bonus episodes, and the weekly program, Behind the Screens. You've been listening to an Audio Wall original, produced by Byron McCoy, theme music provided by Cemeteries. For more programs like this, visit audiowool.co.